and um, we would move on to the to the uh, um, the unconference part. Um, there have been a few. Um, I can also do this one. There have been there have been a few um, people that that wanted to uh, to speak. I would suggest that uh, we can give everyone like two or three minutes to just um, make their. Um, their statements, whatever it is. You could also consider um, taking the time to pitch an idea for, for the hackathon, uh, something in, in this direction. I know that Thomas uh, is already here uh, because he needs to go first. <laughs> yeah. Um. Do I need to do something? Ah, okay, good. Huh. Okay, well. Hmm. Okay, so by accident I have, so I'm working as a um, consultant and by accident I have my web page open. So, <laughs> <laughs> of course, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I, of course, visit that website every day, so, um, yeah, so, um, okay, so, um, what is the thing I want to show? So, I, uh, recently I had a, um, a task, so um, we are developing a software for um, intracellular electrophysiology for a research institute, um, and um, we had the problem that our software, like, is supposed to read all old, old data it ever produced, but we kind of like missed some parts uh, in like reading old formats. And so we figured out, yeah, well, we need to test our new software on the old data, which was created by the old version of the software. So, well, I mean, you can just write CI tests, no big deal. Um, but the thing is, um, our data is kind of like compresses really well, and we actually want to store the data with the code. So, and, and the raw data currently is like 10 gigabytes, and it's, if, it, if you compress it, it's like 500 megabytes. So it's a factor of 20, which is like, yeah, cool. I want to like use it compressed. But um, and I looked into Git Annex like half a year ago, and was like, yeah, okay. So there is no built-in solution for compression. I was like, yeah, okay. So. Um, I'm not using that now. So, and uh, but yesterday I was like, okay, well, let's uh, chat with uh, Joey and uh, ask how that could be done. And he was like, yeah, you just have to implement the special remote. And I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> that sounds like a research project. But okay, actually, it's pretty easy. So, um, what I did, so I checked out the Git Annex re uh, uh, repository and I went to the documentation and there is an example.sh um, a bash file which implements a special remote and I just adapted that for doing compression and so the first thing I did, well, I just removed the um, setting up the credentials because, well, for hacking I don't need that. And then I just, like, r really just changed two lines with, uh, instead of copying, I'm using Z standard for compressing, and I'm really compressing hard because I am ever only compress once and read then back. And so, yeah, instead of like uh, copying, I compress, and instead of copying back, I uncompress, and that's it. That's the whole, like, special remote. So that's a really cool thing because it's, like, so short. Um, yeah, and if I, and if you then, I mean, if you do that, the next step is, okay, you have to like copy your example.sh and name it like something which is not yet taken up. Or, um, probably you will use compress. Uh, and then, well, and then you just register your uh, remote with this command line, um, which is actually, I mean, it's a bit longish, but it's actually, hey, it's like only one line. And what you can also do is where's built-in support for like um, uh, then testing the whole thing. And um, so it's like git annex test remote. You just do that and then your custom remote is tested with a standard test and I ran that earlier 
um, and all tests pass. And if you then like commit your file, you can just see, okay, so in your, um, in your custom remote, you can just then see, okay, well, this, this is really like, um, uh, da, 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 da. is it like compressed remote? And it's, if you use file, it's, well, it says it's set standard compressed data, so you're really storing it compressed. And, but if you're then looking locally, it's, and if you do just a cat on the one, it's not compressed, and that's what I wanted to do. So, yeah, thanks, and All thank right. you for letting me go first. Thank you. Ideally, you self-schedule. Self-schedule. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, thanks, Bye. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna just, uh, uh, talk briefly about the Git Annex branch, which I'm sure everybody knows exists, and it's where it keeps track of, uh, hang on a minute, let me get my display up if I can. Yeah. Um, okay. So we know that there's this Git Annex branch, and it's, it keeps track of where all the files are right now. But since it's a Git branch, there's all these other versions of it out there that keep track of where the files were. So what can we do with this? Um, so here's, I have a mailbox file from 1996. I can say git annex log, and it tells me each repository that it came into and left throughout time, which is mildly interesting, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what else can we do with this? Um, well, um, this past fall I implemented this thing, uh, git annex log total sizes GNU plot, and so it's just tracking the sizes of the repository of all the repositories that contain all my data in this particular uh, data set, as it were. So I have uh, 34 terabytes of data that has grown over a few years. That's handy. Um, if you like graphs that go up into the right. <laughs> um, you can also give a variant where you do log dash dash sizes and then it just separates it out by different repository. This is a different repository. This is my mail repository. So I have uh, uh, 250 gigabytes of email across 10 drives or something. Okay, that's handy. Um, here's another one. You can do git annex log um, dash dash received. I'm doing an interval of 30 days to get like one one readout per month, and then dash dash sizes, and you get a basically a bandwidth, um, monthly bandwidth used by transferring files between um, any you know drive that has data in it. So that's kind of cool. Um, you may notice the dash dash GNU plot up there. It just tells it spit out a GNU plot, plot graph. You can also leave it off, and you get CSV that you can then put into something that isn't GNU plot that looks better. Um, and also, this looks horrible, and I don't know how to make it look better, and I'll bet that some of you might have at some point in your career actually used GNU plot <laughs> and know how to make this look better, so give me a yell. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? Remy. No slides. Sorry? No slides. No slides and no computer because I, I couldn't be bothered. Uh, <laughs> uh, so most of us, when we use Datalad or Git Annex or Git, we have to use the command line. And we know that it's a friction point for new users. So uh, how to ease that? Um, and when you start helping someone and on their computer and they open a terminal to your heart, you realize that they're using the base terminal of their OS and you go like, oh my god, you live in, in an undecorated house. How can you live like that, right? <laughs> so um, this is where I want to introduce this thing called uh, Oh My Z Shell, which is uh, sort of a framework extension. I don't know what, what they call it for uh, the Z Shell sort of uh, command line. So um, I think if you're a Mac user, now they all use Z Shell by default, so it should be easy to adopt. For others, you may have to switch. If you're interested, you don't have to. Um, similar for just having nice prompt and nice sort of um, 
sort of uh, command line. Uh, I think there's something called Starship and a few other projects like this. So um, OMIZ shell will come with a whole bunch of themes uh, that you can just easily, where you can easily adapt how your prompt, prompt looks like. I know you're all geeks, so you know that you can edit your prompts if, if you're not a geek and you can just like click one button or change one name in one config file and it will just do everything for you. It makes your life much easier and it will sort of, your prompt will then tell you on which branch you are, if you have a clean working tree and a whole bunch of things that I would never have you know, bothered to do if I had not discovered this. Uh, the other thing of uh, Oh My Zeke Shell is uh, plugins. Um, there's like 300 of them for just anything from like um, Git, Debian, Ubuntu, like whatever. Uh, and they come with a whole bunch of things. The main thing that they will uh, do is uh, they come up uh, with, usually with a whole bunch of aliases for your command line. If you're like me and you cannot touch type and you type like a baboon and you make like a typo every third keystroke, this is fantastic. Uh, so I started using that and just like I actually it's also a very good way to learn new git or data lat or git command because you realize there's this whole bunch of things and you're going to Start be you start using uh, commands that you would never never use otherwise because you could not be bothered to type them because they're way too long anyway and you cannot remember them. Um, and what I've started doing, if I think two years ago, a year ago, I don't remember when I did that, but I was like, uh, data lad command are too long. I mean, data lad, just typing that, that's just way too long. So I just like, no, I need a shorter, something shorter. So um, I started creating a plugin for data lad, and at the moment it had, just has a bunch of aliases, but I was like. Um, maybe you have some aliases that you could suggest, or maybe there are some that I've put in there, maybe should not be in there. So um, I'll send a link to the uh, plugin so you can like make suggestions. Uh, and I don't think there is a plugin for Git Annex. So maybe that could be something interested because I suspect that Git Annex also has commands that could be aliased. So there you go, that was my talk with no slides. And Thank, you. Here. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have, Matthias, I don't know. You seem to be ready. So let's hope this works. I just move that over, yes, that's great. So um, I just uh, want to quickly make you aware of a project. So um, we've heard uh, the term gin a few times today. Uh, gin is a fork of Gox that uh, enables Gox to, to uh, be utilized with Git Annex. Uh, that's great, it's hosted on gin.gnode.org, but um, it is very much outdated. So the latest commit here is from three years ago on the live branch, it's four years ago. Um, and it's hard to update because it not just adds Git Annex, but there are more changes. Um, so I uh, took a look uh, at what's available uh, otherwise. And there's this great Gitty fork, which just adds a patch set that it, um, enables Git Annex on Gitty, which is like, uh, I, uh, I checked, it's 2,300 lines of code, so somewhat reasonable, um, which can easily be uh, adapted to, to the latest uh, Gitty release to keep up with security fixes and stuff like that, uh, that when you're self-hosting it. So if you need a self-hosted Git service, which can deal with Git Annex, this might be it. Um, yes, yeah, so yeah, you can see it's a bit outdated right now, um, but I've tried it and it does uh, apply with like three merge conflicts on, on the latest uh, version of Git as well. Uh, I have uh, another fork of it which uh, adds some some functionality that we use at uh, our institute, IEK7, Forschungszentrum. Um, for our instance, which you can also publicly find under address.fz.de, uh, if you want to check that out, how that looks, and um, yeah, if you click on Explore, you can find some some repositories here. For example, one from my master thesis. And um, what's cool about it is, uh, if you have data stored in in Git Annex, in such a repository, uh, you can get uh, web previews uh, without an issue. For example, here's a NetCDF file. That's something that uh, 
yeah, it's it's a binary file with metadata uh, for like atmospheric variables and stuff that, like that. Um, and well, you can uh, with the Gitty functionality to to customize these previews. You can script it to, for example, show you a header of that file what it contains. That's so in this case, there's a time series in here. <laughs> I, Um, I, just a quick disclaimer, I'm uh, not a developer of this project. I sort of found it as a user. Um, there's no code in it from me yet. I have some pull requests open uh, to, to fix some rough edges uh, that I hope can get merged at some point. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So we have, we have some, some five minutes left. I think he, was, he, went, he wanted. Oh, many people want. So we have, like, we can collectively decide to uh, just ignore the schedule. Is it, like, they're, 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 oh no! But I'll be quick. I'll be yeah, quick. One minute. Yeah, one, one minute. minute. One minute. One minute. Well, be. That's Fifty-five crazy. seconds. Fifty-five. Fifty-three. So what I forgotten to present yesterday, as part of any of our talks, is actually what's the uh, what's there in that name, Data Lab, right, and how it came about. And hopefully it eventually appears. So here we go. No, you want to go to that one. Okay. So what's in that name, right? So data let. And let me bring another terminal. Uh, do you know what's in the name Git? Hmm? So uh, who knows what Git means really in in kind of language of humans? Um, so that that's pretty much what it is. I, I'm just pre kind of. St setting up the stage, right? So it's a person who deemed despicable, contemptible, and the so not, nothing good really, right? Uh, okay, so what's in the name of data, uh, data lab? So when it began for us, you've heard that we reserve, oh, no, you haven't heard. Actually, that's what I was doing, this um, archaeology. I, uh, we reserved the domain name data, data git, Dot org before we even made the first commit in the repository. And uh, in the repository, we had a Git web I've mentioned, then we had tool page to annex, code refactor to reside under data Git Python package in July. And um, we started to work on proposal in January 2014, right? So that's where suspense begins. Uh, we submitted request to softwareconservancy.org on use of Git in the name uh, because they hold the trademark, right? So, and that's my kind of lesson to you, never talk to lawyers. Uh, <laughs> then in January, we submit proposal with that name, data Git, and we received response in August uh, from them must respectfully decline. There is a thread after, but we'll not cover it now. And uh, so we started to work on something which name was kind of flexible, let's put it this way, right? And immediately I flew into Germany, right? So we could resolve that issue once and for all. And uh, entire weekend, we worked really heavily with lots of inspiration from different medium, uh, and which <laughs> resulted in the best variant uh, of the name, which was FTF. What? Exactly. Faster than floppy. <laughs> if you think about it, it's, it, it, it is true. And that acronym is still not reserved. So. It's easier to type as well. And exactly, exactly, exactly. But uh, so with that in my mind, right, I flew back into the States, right? And I think that's where it memory becomes murky a little bit because I didn't find yet documental support for that. And Michael messages that he figured it out. Okay, so and he figured it out based on oh boy this uh, so that's the image which inspired the mind of the greatest, right? So if we go back to the terminal, right, and we actually type lad, right? So what lad means is a boy, a man, and it's like a m so uh, only kind of very nice, a companion, a comrade, a mate, right? So it, it's, it's all good things. So now compared to the previous definition you've seen, right? We are just serving the wide side of the spectrum, you know, when you go from one definition to another one, right? But then uh, there were also negative feedback. We received one about lead culture in 90s in UK. How could you possibly name your project data lead? It's like the abomination. So, uh, but we didn't rename it since then. So that's the history of the project. Now you know. Less. <laughs> now you know. Okay. Okay.
how do you feel? Let's go. Do we still have time? Sure, two minutes. Two minutes? Well, for now, it's two minutes. <laughs> Very, very short and fast. And I just need the. I just want to bring to your attention another very lean uh, distributed data management ecosystem that. Uh, uh, anything visible? Uh, there it is. Good. There you see the slides. Yeah, it's only two or three slides briefly. Called DTool and DServer, and at least two and a half groups in Freiburg where me as a data student, and my coworker Ashwin over there as a developer are based. Um, so uh, it is in many aspects, on DTool and the server in many aspects very similar to DataLet, but m much simpler and smaller and uh, frailer. Um, it uh, packages uh, data and metadata together in data sets and assigns UIDs uh, as persistent identifiers, uh, at its core, it's a Python library with a command line client designed to outlive, so the data sets are meant to outlive the software. Um, very easily extendable, and the, one thing that is maybe a bit different is that there is no underlying dependency on uh, um, Git. Um, it's standardized via its API and can move these data sets also around different storage infrastructure. And then there's another thing that we call the server, which is basically adding the findability when you think in terms of fair um, to those data sets that launches an ad hoc repository on some random uh, storage infrastructure where a few of those data sets are collected. Um, I won't go into much detail of why I'm uh, using this at LiftMats because it would take too long. But uh, what uh, we would actually like to propose is uh, for, for the hackathon is um, making DTool data sets and data led data sets interoperable in some manner, or at least think about whether that would be possible. Um, 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 I think uh, you can find a lot of information on uh, this little DTool ecosystem in the hackathon. Git repository provided a pull request there with information on that. Um, there are a few references. In particular, we have a um, publication on the server in review. I hope that will go through smoothly. And, uh, the um, preprint is findable online. Um, with that, I'd like yeah, to thank you and hope that this would be something interesting for the hackathon. Thank you. So we have 14 minutes till the lights go out. In 40 minutes? Yes, 14. But not, well, 14 total. <laughs> okay, let me make this quick. Um, I just got some uh, requests um, to, to show um, what this textual framework looks like. And um, so this is, an, uh, this is a repository I just made um, from, uh, in Matthias's uh, address. Gitty plus annex uh, thing, it works, I can confirm. And if we just randomly open this control center here, it's, it really behaves like a website, so you can scroll. It even, it live resizes everything, so you could also like grab the site and it will reflow the text. This is a terminal, mind you, right? It's not a website, it's a terminal. And uh, you have these tabs here, you have these nice animations, um, you can have like uh, syntax highlighting uh, in simple terms. Uh, you can have <laughs> light mode and dark mode. <laughs> you can take screenshots. You can, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite funny. And um, this is all Python. This is like 300, 400 lines of Python for all of this. And uh, this makes uh, GUI programming fun again, just as a. <laughs> Just as a note, and um, to uh, just as a small note on the um, special remote, who was it? Uh, Z standard compressing instead of uh, he left. He left. Oh, amazing! Uh, I <laughs> I can I can still show it a bit. I, I wrote a benchmarker once for um, for compression algorithms, and uh, these are just some results. 
And my findings is that we should all use XZ. <laughs> Perfect timing. If, uh, I mean, uh, he, he was using uh, like Z standard level 22 um, in ultra mode, which is, uh, I mean, it's reasonable to think that the, the, the more like compression intensity you add, the, the better it, was, it is. But I find with Z standard, like the bigger levels do not really make sense. They just take more time, more RAM, and don't really compress better. Nothing beats XZ, actually, like in the, in this, in the, the ones that I compared. Uh, XZ is, of course, slow, but it's, it's fairly um, RAM. Um, cons uh, it doesn't use as much RAM. Uh, sorry for the alpha problems here. Down here you can see XZ. It uses very little RAM compared to, to, the, other, um, to the other things. Um, and Z standard is just um, like the RAM usage skyrockets in, in the 22 level. So uh, you use like 900 megabytes of RAM for uh, what was this like a 40 megabyte file to compress? Like what, what, what the heck is this? Um, yeah, just as a note. All right, thank you. Who's still itching? Uh, can, I, can I just have like one less than one minute? Sure. Okay. No, this is, I've thought about it and I think I regret it if I didn't share this. And... So I've been playing around with this tool. And it's called uh, Git. Bunch. I was thinking of calling it git bind. Is it? Oh my God! Is it coming up? There you are. Okay. Really quick. It solves a really big issue that I've been having. It might be generally useful. I'm just trying to get my terminal to come up here. It creates an octopus commit, uh, an octopus uh, merge, and a branch that essentially anchors any other branches that you provide in a ref spec. And what that can be used for is non-destructively cleaning out your branch namespace. And it's got a bunch of other uses. It's, even with Git Annex, it lets you programmatically bundle um, multiple branches together in a way which can be you know, really easy to extract. So I have a simple proof of concept here. This is a, this is a burner laptop. It doesn't have all my stuff installed on it. Um, no, I mean, but I just want to give you an example of um, yeah, with a CRC. OK, so we got some branches right here. So we'll get bunch, get bunch, save. By default, it creates a branch which just is all the local um, locally checked out branches and it creates, so it uses no actual data is added, it stores all of this in metadata. So it creates in the commit message um, uh, a key value of every single value. So now we can, um, so, and if we check this branch out, right? Contains nothing. So let's, uh, sorry. <laughs> All right, so we got no other branches. So get bunch, redecorate. Oh, I have to give it the name of the branch, but the point is, like before I was playing, I, there's one called audio branches. Uh, audio branches. <sighs> what the heck was it? I, I haven't touched this in a few months and I dusted it all off. Uh, and I really don't think I should be using B as a name for. I think we should move on. Okay, all right. What? You know. Okay, anyway, thanks for your time. I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Thank you.
I think the, 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 the chat rooms will continue to exist. They're, they're not you know, going away. So if you, if you have the solution, you just post it as a, 